Well, hello again, everyone. We're uh, continuing with our Ideologies course, 1920, on the NPTEL program, 2019 and 20. And um, we're in the middle of our 11th topic, which is nationalism. This is the start of our third lecture on it. And we're going to move on from self-determination, which we concluded with last time, we're going to move on from there to a, to a theme that runs through nationalism. We'll continue with that. Um, and the theme is that of what, what actually makes a nation, what constitutes a nation. Our theme today leads on from self-determination, and it is that of identity politics. Well, nationalism, as we've seen, like conservatism and fascism, relies on, we saw this last time, and develops conceptions of identity. It draws on concepts like territory, religion, and language, and on less tangible things, or less obviously tangible things, like memory and will and political loyalty. This does remind or tell people who they are and what brings them together as a people, but, as we saw last time, in its stronger and more strident forms, we saw this also with fascism, it can inculcate, um, nationalism can inculcate a sense of identity or, uh, or, or purpose, but these aren't necessarily always benign, and we'll see that there are potential complications here. These less tangible elements may also explain how it is that nationalism is often very prominent in politics, and why nationalist politicians or writers are often very popular, in some cases for long periods of time. Uh, and this happens even if, uh, as we shall see, much of the theory of nationalism is contradictory and even incoherent. We're all, of course, very well aware that nationalism has its own ugly and very ugly side. We see these sides manifested very frequently. Well, how then is this tied up with identity politics? Well, nationalism is sometimes based on identity politics, and we're familiar with the phenomenon. We need to look um, at some of the thinking behind it. When nationalism is based on identity politics, it involves the idea of a national consciousness. Proponents of such forms of nationalism often draw on what they claim are national myths, national traditions, national folk tales, and national legends. And they do this to define or specify the national consciousness which they advocate. For example, in Germany, there were two philosophers, Johann Herder, 1744 to 1803, and Johann Fichte, 1762 to 1814. And uh, Herder and Fichte were among the most noted proponents of this particular form of nationalism. Herder seems to have held that each nation possesses its own national spirit. He seems, though, to have considered this to be a matter of language and culture, and he seems also to have rejected the idea of a hierarchy of nations. I've drawn that from a paper by Forster, dated 2007. Well. That kind of thinking, that kind of herder thinking, is uh, often called cultural nationalism. And um, uh, at least in theory, this form of this kind of cultural nationalism is a little bit different from nationalist theories based on ethnic membership or ethnic nationalism. That is both racially and culturally exclusivist. In extreme forms, it amounts to fascism. And it does have permanently fascistic undertones. So um, that kind of um, nationalism based on uh, ethnic membership or ethnic nationalism is somewhat different from the kind of thing that Herder's putting forward, his conception of, uh, uh, of cultural nationalism seems to see that, seems to see national identity as more a matter of language and culture. Well, there are there are various contexts in which um, nationalism has historically emerged, and it seems to have arisen when peoples have been subjected to, um, 
to prolonged colonial or imperial rule. What we now call Germany, what we now know as Germany, was an area of 39 states, including city-states, before the Prussian army's victories over Austria in 1866 and France in 1870-71. Those victories enabled the Prussian ruler Wilhelm I to proclaim himself the German Emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm, and to claim that Germany had been unified. In effect, it was the spread of Napoleonic rule across much of Europe that had given rise to nationalistic uprisings. Napoleon, at one time, looked as though he would come to dominate the whole of Europe, and he got very close to taking Moscow, as you no doubt are aware. But similar developments, partly in response to Napoleonic rule or, or the threat of it, um, or the, the memory of it, similar developments occurred in Italy and in Latin America in response to colonial rule. In Italy, certainly, um, Napoleonic rule was the issue. In Latin America, Iberian, that is Portuguese and Spanish rule, were, were, the, colonial, uh, were the colonial forms of rule. Um, in in uh, Latin America, the, the major nationalist leader, Simon Bolivar, 1783 to 1830, led successful uprisings against imperial Spain. Several independent countries, such as Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela, were founded as a result. And I draw that point from Haywood, 2007. Well, similar things could be said about India. Well, similar things could be said about India. Before the achievement of independence in 1947, the idea of India as a single nation may not even have figured in the thinking of the hundreds of rulers in the geographical area now called South Asia. Now that's not to deny various kinds of broad linguistic and cultural commonalities, that's the best word I can use. These were not rigid commonalities and they were not frozen and certainly weren't necessarily imposed. Uh, and they've been noted, um, you know, I add this now, they've been noted as forming a, an idea of India, and people like, uh, scholars like Shashi Tharoor have mentioned them in their own work on, on earlier senses of an Indian identity, of an, in, uh, an identity that, that was known as India. Those have more to do with language and culture and patterns of cultivation and food and perhaps even patterns of clothing and so on. But the idea of India as a single nation may not even have figured in the thinking of hundreds of people who ruled the geographical area we now call South Asia. Even in the first war of independence in 1857, some of those involved in the uprising, such as the Rani of Jhansi, seem to have been relatively indifferent to the fate of the kingdoms or other areas around them let alone the wider region of what we know, we know today as India. Even um, some of the most courageous among those who fought in the War of Independence in, 19, in 1857 seems to have little or no awareness of what has been called, I quote, a great cause for which they were prepared to sacrifice their narrow selfish interests. I take that quotation about the great cause from uh, Professor Abel's book, uh, Glimpses of Indian Nationalist Movement, published in 2005. Now this state of affairs, this sense of not self-absorption, but relative, I, pe I repeat, relative indifference to a wider sense of what we would now call a sense of India, this state of affairs continued until and even after independence for some time. It's well enough known that the 561 princely states at the time of independence were extremely suspicious of and even hostile to the Indian National Congress for a range of reasons. It's also fairly widely known that very few of them had any wish to accede to the incipient Indian Union. I draw that from Walter Reed's book published in 2016. 
in the end, it um, you know what what led the princely states to to accept the fact of India and their presence within it, uh, modern India as a state and their presence within it. What led them to accept that may have been I'm, I'm speculating a little here may have been nothing other than the facts of geography and the fact that almost none of the princely states had the slightest chance of defending them themselves against attack by other countries. Those were likely to have been the main, the main reasons for their accession to the Union, the Union of India. Now that of course has changed very greatly in the last few decades. The princely states are now simply part of the states of India, where they happen to be. And many of the former rulers are now significant political participants in the Indian Republic. Many of them have joined political parties, have led them to stand for election in the usual way. You'll be aware that they made the maintenance of certain privileges, like the privy purses, one of the conditions of their membership of the Indian Union and the privy purses were eventually uh, abolished if I remember rightly in the early 70s not without disagreement and acrimony but that happened and today uh, the, the, the rulers of the former princely states are citizens of the Republic of India many of them even ch have even changed their names so that they don't, don't claim uh, so to speak princely or royal status and just use their, their own given names well, what are, the, uh, what's the, what are the consequences for the idea of nationalism? It, it is an ideology, but it's, it's so elastic and even amorphous, almost shapeless, that its political expressions inevitably draw from other ideologies. And therefore, there are forms of nationalism which fall into relatively clear strands. Uh, these show, of course, strong inheritances from particular ideologies and we need to be able to identify the main forms. What are these? What are these main forms? They are liberal nationalism, conservative nationalism and reactionary nationalism and expansionist nationalism. So I'll repeat the list. Liberal nationalism, conservative nationalism, and reactionary nationalism and finally expansionist nationalism. Well let's look at liberal nationalism first. This may well be one of the oldest forms of nationalism. It dates from the French Revolution and the ideas which informed that some of that revolution, in particular those which were put forward by Jean-Jacques Rousseau 1712 to 1778. For example, in addition, Polish struggles for independence from Russia led Rousseau to conclude that there is such a thing as the general will. He looked at the example of Poland and concluded that there is such a thing as a general will. And he concluded that this is vested in any culturally unified people. That's Rousseau's sense of it, Rousseau's articulation of the concept. Therefore, monarchical or autocratic government is illegitimate and according to Rousseau governments must express the public will. Sovereignty would therefore reside with the people and not the monarch and the people ceased therefore in that conception to be under that conception the people ceased to be subjects of a monarch. Instead they became citizens of a nation. That is citizens who possessed inalienable rights and duties. This is a highly political vision as under it citizenship is both a national and a political status and as a political status it involves and requires a certain form of political organization. Now this in turn gives rise to the idea of the nation-state and that's a concept we shall examine in a later section as we proceed a little bit later on. Now what Rousseau articulated was something very recognizable as a modern conception of citizenship. 
and in part we owe that concept, that modern form of the concept, to Rousseau and his inheritors. The concept of citizenship, therefore, involves nationalism as well as citizenship in liberal forms. We, you'll recall some of these from our liberalism topic, the idea of the modern citizen, the individual with inalienable rights, is a typically liberal concept. It had the result that, or has had the result, that liberal principles, such as mutual non-interference, such as tolerance, such as the right to national liberty or self-determination, are therefore central not only within states, but also central to relations between states, and could also constitute the basis for the international order. We can recognize those concepts when we look at the contemporary international order and the principles on which that is organized. Now, there are consequences. Citizens who enjoy rights within their national boundaries, under this modern concept of citizenship, are also obliged to ensure that their own governments don't restrict the rights of other citizens in other countries to live their lives as they wish. So this goes beyond nationalism, right? Here we get a concept of citizenship as political, and its implications and consequences go beyond nationalism per se to a form of internationalism. Many of the founding ideas of global or multilateral bodies, such as the UN or the EU, the European Union, many of the founding ideas of those organizations show the widespread acceptance of such principles. That will also, um, you know, a further result is that member states of bodies, such bodies, are expected to work towards negotiated agreements. For example, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, was founded in 1985, and it explicitly excludes discussion of bilateral issues, that is, issues between any two member states of SARC. Now, in relation to other regions of the world, the UN often has a very substantial role in agreements between states. For example, the British Good Friday Agreement, which was signed in 1980, 1998, I beg your pardon, 1998, um, the British Good Friday Agreement effectively ended violence so severe in Northern Ireland that it amounted to civil war. It's a UN treaty. It comprises two parts. One signed by most of the Northern Ireland political parties and the other signed only by the British government and the government of the Republic of Ireland, the government of a separate state. Now, these are all examples of the way uh, the kind of conception of citizenship and self-determination and national identity, which Rousseau articulated in the um, 18th century and which we have inherited today in sometimes modified forms. Um, these conceptions of citizenship involve the idea of inalienable rights and have consequences for the organization of states and for the ways states conduct themselves towards one another. Now, those are typically liberal and recognizably modern forms of, of the idea of citizenship and of national identity. The two go hand in hand in these conceptions. But there's another form of nationalism. Rousseau's form can be called liberal nationalism, or the form we inherit from, broadly from Rousseau. It can be, called conservative, can be called liberal nationalism. There are other forms, and we need to look at conservative and reactionary nationalism. Well, conservative thinkers and leaders have often regarded nationalism as a dangerous and destabilizing force, especially when their own subjects have a variety of ethnic, religious, linguistic, or other origins. But towards the end of the 19th century, leaders like the British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, a conservative, the first German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, and the Russian Tsar Alexander III, all came to see nationalism as a unifying force. And 
that it would, uh, came to see that it could help them to maintain order and to preserve the traditional institutions of their countries and societies. Now, strong forms of conservative nationalism are often expressed in vehemently exclusivist and even racist terms. They're often very obvious today. For example, in the United Kingdom, they were expressed for a long time and no doubt will continue to be expressed in the form of hostility to membership of the European Union, which, as you I'm sure know, the United Kingdom left on the 31st of January 2020. That's just a few days ago, less than a week ago. In the European Union, member states accept a point in the founding treaty of the old European Economic Community, the Treaty of Rome, 1957. Member states accept, when they join or accede to the EU, member states accept that under EU rules, under EU law, the law of the EU takes precedence over domestic law in the event of an actual or possible clash of laws. And opposition to this kind of supranational authority, even if member states agree to it, opposition often takes the, within member states, often takes the form of aggressive and sometimes violent hostility to citizens of other EU states who are nevertheless, under EU law, entitled to live and work in any member state. In the United Kingdom, this has occasionally been a very ugly manifestation of hostility towards, towards the uh, EU and towards other EU member states. Um, and it's a form, it's one of the, the more extreme forms of conservative nationalism that is being expressed here. Now, the Conservative Party, one of the major British political parties, and the party that has been in office since 2010. The Conservative Party has always been deeply divided over membership of the former EEC and now the EU. And um, yet, I mean, at the time I wrote this, 2016 or so, when I wrote the first edition of the book, the most visible nationalist party was the UK Independence Party, or UKIP. It won 15% of the votes in the 2015 general election. But under the simple majority or first-past-the-post electoral system, it gained only one seat in the House of Commons, the lower chamber of parliament. Now its fortunes changed in the 2000 in, and in the 2017 general election, the UKIP vote share amount uh, collapsed to 1.8 percent and uh, the party won no seats. Those other political factors and the electorate were free to make their own decisions on it. UKIP is much less prominent than it used to be and um, some of its former members formed their own party, a uh, separate party called the Brexit Party, led by uh, the former MEP, now former MEP Nigel Farage. But, if, if, I've got, if I'm not mistaken over that. But, there are other Western countries where forms of ethno-nationalism express conservative nationalism and are very prominent. These include Germany. In Germany, the Alternative für Deutschland Party, IFD or AFD, has gone from opposing the Eurozone bailouts for Greece in 2013 to a much more wide-ranging and extreme nationalist position. This involves, this extreme nationalist position involves expressing particular hostility towards Germany's substantial Turkish-descended minority and towards the West Asian refugees whom the government, the German government, has admitted to the country in the last three years or so. I draw that point from the BBC. Uh, some of the IFD's own members' positions have been so extreme that even their first leader, Bernd Lucke, left the party over its increasing xenophobia. But in 2016, the party took second place in the provincial elections in Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania. It got 21% as against the Social Democratic Party's 36%. The IFD has repeatedly won seats in other provincial assemblies as well and uh, openly asserts that multicultural and multinational societies cannot work. Now, these are particularly strident forms of conservative nationalism, but they're not the longest standing in, in contemporary or in recent decades in, in Western Europe. One of the most successful and long standing conservative nationalist parties in continental Europe 
is the French Front National, or National Front. This was founded in 1972 as an assemblage of far-right parties, and it's now a strong national party. The party won several municipalities in the 2014 municipal elections, and it topped the regional elections in 2015, with 28% of the national vote. It also won the French elections to the European Parliament in 2014, with a quarter of the French votes to the European to that Parliament. The party's leader, Marine Le Pen, came second in the first round of the next presidential election that was held on the 23rd of April 2017, and Marine Le Pen got 21.3% of the vote. There was a runoff, runoff vote between the first and second, that is the French system, and in the second and decisive round, which was on the 7th of May 2017, Emmanuel Macron, who had won the first round with 24.01%, won by 66.1% to Le Pen's 33.9%. The Front National's main positions are socially conservative and economically protectionist. Economic protection, economic protectionism, as I'm sure you know, runs directly counter to the EU's Single European Act. That dates from the old EEC days, and it was passed in 1986 or 87. Much of the Front National support, however, results from its hostility to mass immigration. The party's expressions of this often come close to open Islamophobia and other forms of racism, and uh, they seem to be based on the idea that large cultural and religious minorities are a threat to French national unity. That's the, uh, the conservative nationalist element in the Front National's outlook. Now, as this National Front, the French National Front, has gained more widespread support, well, at the same time, the leader has moderated some of the party's more obviously xenophobic positions. She uh, even presided over the expulsion of the previous leader, Jean-Marie Le Pen, who happened to be her father. His attitudes were very extreme, and he publicly all but denied the Holocaust. Indeed, his reference to Nazi gas chambers as, I quote, a detail of the Second World War was what led to his expulsion from the party. That was just too much. Too much for the party to take, and they threw him out. But certain other countries uh, in Europe continue with extreme forms of xenophobic nationalism, and one of the most obvious is Hungary. In Hungary, the Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, started his second term in 2010 on an explicit and extreme nationalist platform, which he calls illiberal democracy. Orban's Fidesz Hungarian Civic Union in Hungarian, the Fidesz Magyar Polyari uh, Silvice currently rules in coalition with the Christian Democratic People's Party. And the two together, well, particularly Orban's party, the, the Hungarian, uh, Fidesz Hungarian Civic Union, has espoused positions so extreme that the European Union has warned that Hungary is at risk of suspension from the EU. So, what does that tell us about the thinking of the current ethno-nationalist or racist nationalist or xenophobic nationalist parties in contemporary Europe? Well, there's something very interesting going on here. None of them makes any mention of the fact that for the task of reconstruction, after the terrible destruction of the Second World War, almost all the larger European countries, that includes the United Kingdom, imported what amounted in all to several million cheap laborers from extremely poor regions of the world. Those territories included former imperial territories as well as Yugoslavia and Portugal. Many of the conditions laid down by the European states concerned were extremely restrictive. Germany, for example, made it very difficult, if not impossible, for imported workers or Gastarbeiter to obtain German citizenship. The obliteration of this fact from European public discourse 
or near obliteration of it, is not is in effect not nationalist but racist, and it constitutes racism on a continental scale, but it barely figures in the contemporary European political discourse, and certainly does not figure in conservative nationalist discourses uh, in the EU countries and its former and the former EU country, the United Kingdom. Well, conservatism nationalism does have less extreme and less xenophobic forms. And one of its greatest moderate European exponents was probably Charles de Gaulle. He led exiled French forces during the Second World War, and then he was president of France from 1959. He played a substantial part in creating the French Fifth Republic to end a serious constitutional crisis. And so from 1959, he was president of France, president of the Fifth Republic. But de Gaulle's form of conservative nationalism which he'd introduced as head of the provisional government towards the end of the war, involved substantial state support for and direction of the economy. This kind of nationalism seems to appear in established, well-established states, and it shares many of its main contentions, main arguments with conservatism, such as a view of society as organic, and um, it, this form of nationalism also places great value on the traditions and historical inheritances which, according to conservatism, make countries what they are. The resulting policies can cause tensions even with international allies. De Gaulle, for example, made France an associate member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, from 1965 onwards. And he did this rather than allow France to continue being a full member. And one reason was his insistence on France's having an independent defense and foreign policy. This caused his, de Gaulle's NATO allies, France's NATO allies, a great deal of anger and dismay. because They saw it as weakening NATO, which for them uh, was uh, a necessary strategic alliance against the threat of the Warsaw Treaty Organization, um, also known as the Warsaw Pact. We must remember here that the Warsaw Pact was signed, the Warsaw Treaty Organization was set up in response to the formation of NATO, which I if I remember rightly took place in 1949. The Warsaw Pact was founded a few years later and actually had an abolition date, which wasn't that long ago, it might have been about 2000 or so, or 2004 if I remember rightly. Um, but uh, Certainly, uh, France's decision to become an associate member of NATO did cause the, um, the other members a great deal of, of uh, anxiety and anger. Well, that's conservative nationalism, and we see plenty of it around us in many different parts of the world. We see many expressions of it, some which are very extreme indeed, and amount to the expression of severe religious hatred as well as ethno-nationalism and quasi-fascistic racist nationalism or ethnic nationalism. Well, what about expansionist nationalism? Now, this too is connected with imperialism and fascism. We've already seen that fascism rejects all state boundaries. We've seen the ultra-nationalist element in fascism. Why all state boundaries are, you know, why does um, expansionist nationalism reject all state boundaries as fascism does? Well, because these are regarded under these concepts as false and artificial creations. They divide and weaken the unity of races. And for fascism, as we've seen, racial membership is the defining feature of human membership. Races are the defining units of human membership. Therefore, according to fascist theory, the superior races must unite across all frontiers and they must ultimately be assembled into some sort of fascist territory which only they occupy. That process will inevitably involve violent conquest. It will also involve mass expulsions and finally mass extermination. Well, aggressive or expansionist nationalism often shows similar tendencies. It had its historical peak in the 18th and 19th centuries, when the major European powers extended their empires across most of the world. 
This form of expansion was accompanied by often crude but highly popular expressions of racial and cultural superiority, including the conviction that the so-called white races, especially the European ones, had a duty to colonize all others with a view to elevating them morally and culturally. The British imperialist politician T.B. Macaulay even told Parliament, he was speaking about India, he even told Parliament in 1833 that, I quote, to have found a great people sunk in the lowest depths of slavery and superstition, to have ruled them so as to make them desirous and capable of all the privileges of citizens, would indeed be a title to glory all our own. End of quotation. Other forms of expansionist nationalism have sometimes been expressed in Russia, and they involve the idea that Russians are the, I quote, natural leaders of all Slavic peoples. I take the quotation from Hayward. What would that mean? It would mean that all who speak Slavic languages are, in effect, subordinate to the leadership of Russia and Russians, and it would also mean that Slavs are in some way culturally superior to peoples who inherit other cultures. Similar claims are made elsewhere. They're made to time, from time to time all, all around the world. They're made in varying cultural and political contexts. And um, the attitudes concerned have given rise to particular forms of terminology. One of the words used for expansionist nationalism is jingoism. That was coined in the 1870s and means aggressive or militarist nationalism. Another word often used is chauvinism, which is derived from the name of Nicolas Chauvin, a French soldier. He was a French soldier, Nicolas Chauvin, and he was also a fanatical follower of Napoleon Bonaparte. Well, does that then mean that these are the only forms of nationalism? We need to start looking at some of the responses. We will come to them next time, before we do our worked example. But I'll cover them briefly here. Nationalism and colonialism, well, do go together. Certain forms of nationalism are direct responses to the experience of colonialism and imperialism. In 1920, Britain ruled a quarter of the land surface of the globe and 420 million people. That was just under a quarter of the world's population at the time. France, including its European territories, ruled about a third of the area of the world, and it encompassed about uh, 110 million people. These were the largest empires yet known in human history. Together with the Dutch and Portuguese empires, they also subjugated and controlled well over half a billion people. And they did so often in conditions of great cruelty and brutality. For example, the aboriginals of Tasmania were exterminated by white invaders. And in a climate of racism and cultural contempt, well, imperial rule has generated lasting bitterness, which continues very obviously in our own time. So too, unfortunately, do the, do the racism and cultural contempt with which peoples in former imperial powers regard peoples of former subject nations. Despite all the legislation, despite the increasing interconnectedness, obviously in, obvious interconnectedness of the world, these attitudes continue on the sides of the imperial powers, uh, among the imperial powers, and also among the former subject powers. Well, we need not be at all surprised that colonial and imperial rule resulted in the emergence of nationalist movements. We needn't be at all surprised that colonial and imperial rule themselves pay, played a part in creating the idea of nations where, before colonial conquest, other senses of association and authority had obtained. A further important element in many of the uh, 
anti-colonial national liberation movements was a commitment to economic self-determination. This was partly because the modern imperial powers had industrial economies which needed enormous supplies of raw materials and which produced far more than their own populations could possibly consume. We've seen this in the light of Marx. Well, the imperial powers plundered raw materials from their colonies and sold the resulting finished goods back to what were in effect captive markets, where the populations were prevented from developing their own productive systems. In India, this is only too familiar. The move by the Indian independence leaders to defy this forced consumption by starting the Swadeshi movement caused, caused the colonials very great alarm. Lenin regarded imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism, and he also noted that the colonization of markets applies to rivalries between industrialized countries, countries which um, compete for markets in one another's economies as well. Now, the economic element in anti-colonial or post-colonial nationalism often drew on ideas which the colonials themselves largely unintentionally imparted to those colonial leaders who had been to school or done, who had done higher studies in imperial countries. Academics who founded and taught in universities in the British and French empires also played a part in teaching the philosophic and political ideas of the imperial powers own intellectual traditions. They too may well have had the effect, these professors may well have had the effect of aiding the developing independence movements among colonized peoples. Many leaders of the independence movements also saw, saw the inequalities of their own societies as a moral and political evil, and many of them included a strong socialist element in their nationalist campaigns for independence. The resulting political economy ranged from, for example, the broadly social democratic outlook of Jawaharlal Nehru to the more explicitly Marxist commitments of Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam and of Fidel Castro, the Cuban leader. Perhaps the, the most extreme form of anti-colonial Marxism was that adopted by Mao Zedong, who led China from 1949 to 1978. We need to remember, however, that uh, leaders like Castro and Che Guevara, as we've seen before, she rejected the Soviet model, even if they were much more explicitly Marxist <coughs> than, say, the Indian Social Democratic leaders. Now, the specific relation of Mao's politics and the system he created to Marx's analysis of capitalism is a more complex issue, and uh, we don't need to cover it here. But we do need to note that India's commitment to social democracy, with a broadly state-managed, not state-controlled, economy, caused the uh, country's emerging business elites such concern that in 1944, they effectively forced a plan known as the uh, Bombay Plan on the Indian National Congress. Under this plan, the state would install the basic infra infrastructure of a modern economy by the late 1970s, <coughs> and then hand much of this over to the private industrial sector. I've drawn this from Vijay Prashad's work and from other analyses. As I've said earlier, Fidel Castro and his fellow revolutionary Ernesto Che Guevara decided not to follow the Soviet model of political economy and to devise their own, which they considered much more appropriate to Cuban conditions. Well, these are only a few of many examples which show that anti-colonial nationalism is as complex as any other form of nationalism. Well, that in turn means that proponents of it face political issues just as much as proponents of any other ideology do, and that they can be manipulated. Now, in India, the colonials often use differences among nationalists to deadly and terrible effect. And um, we'll come back to these examples next time. We'll pause there. We've looked at forms of nationalism, liberal, conservative, reactionary, expansionist, and anti-colonialist. We have got to the point where we can start looking at specific examples of the ways uh, imperial powers often exploited conditions among their colonial subjects to 
maintain colonial rule. We'll look at that next time, and then we'll go on next time into a worked example. So uh, we'll stop here, and we'll catch up next time.